Hey, welcome back for chapter 28. Hopefully that previous exam went well. We're going into the material for our fifth exam, and that is the last one before the cumulative final. So again, if at any point along the way you had uh, questions or concerns about any of the material, let me know so we can get you up to speed on that before the final, because again, it is cumulative. And with that out of the way, let's get straight into the chapter. This is kind of the introduction into microbiology, and for me, this is the fun part of the semester. You may or may not agree with that. So Anton von Leeuwenhoek uh, was the first one, well, he didn't invent the microscope, but he improved the quality of it sufficiently that he could see what he called um, animacules, which animal molecule, whatever, you know. However he came up with that little phrase, word, whatever. I teach science, not English. But anyway, so he described these as microscopic forms of life in water. At the time, they believed in spontaneous generation or abiogenesis, basically that just life, you know, sprung from literally the ether from nothingness into existence. Louis Pasteur uh, discredited that theory later, which uh, we'll talk about here momentarily, but interestingly enough, he also suggested that uh, rabies was caused by a virus. But, uh, so this experiment that Pasteur did here, and I could save us a fair bit of reading if we can just zoom in enough to see the picture. Okay, so you have some broth, you boil it, and uh, if it is exposed to open air, then stuff grows in it, if you just leave it open. If you open it briefly and then close it again, there's much less of it will actually grow anything. So then the second experiment here has got this nice neck on the tube here. So it's exposed to the air, like air can get into it here, but all the dust and particles and contaminants in the air gets caught in the neck of the tube and nothing grows in it. And then later he would, went and took this same container here and broke the neck off of it and stuff grew in it. So it, it proved that there was something being carried through the air, not just you know the air itself, it wasn't just the ether. That's essentially what they're trying to explain here. So microbiology is the study of microbes, a term that includes uh, bacteria, archaea, protists, fungus, viroids, viroids, proton or prions, Basically anything that's, you know, too small to be seen with the living eye, or with the eye. And I was going to say that it's living, but technically virons, prions, and viruses are not considered to be living. I like to think of viruses as malfunctioning cellular machinery, and then prions are even simpler than that. They're malfunctioning rogue proteins. Bacteria are everywhere, in and on everything, including you. For every cell in your body that has your DNA in it, there are 10 that don't. Microbes can cause disease. The, the vast majority of them are inconsequential, let's say, uh, meaning that they do not directly harm or benefit us, and some of them uh, provide us with important benefits like uh, uh, producing vitamin K in your intestine, or um, most of the, the normal microbiota on our bodies um, just simply functions to outcompete things that could be pathogenic. So while they're not directly providing us benefits, they're kind of providing a layer of defense against uh, other things that could be pathogenic. Microbes are essential for the environment. A lot of uh, bacteria and fungi are decomposers. They're the reason that you can walk around outside and you know not be essentially swimming through oceans of putrefied organic material because they've already broken down and digested it for you. Photosynthetic bacteria, algae, and protists are primary producers that capture solar energy, or some of them actually uh, can use inorganic uh, energy sources like uh, sulfur or radiation from rocks. But they provide the vast majority of the, of the photosynthesis for the planet. Like the rainforests are substantial, yes, but nothing compared to all of the photosynthetic organisms in the top inch or so of uh, ocean water. In turn, provide nu uh, nutrition for more complex organisms and um, bacteria process plenty of waste products. We actually have uh, bacteria that have been uh, engineered to consume oil. So if there's an oil spill, you pour them out on it and they will eat up the oil spill instead of it, you know, killing everything. We'd use them in 
industrial processes for food processing, for instance, all of your cheeses are the result of uh, bacteria doing their thing. Some of them have uh, antibiotics, uh, like for instance, uh, the mold, or I'm sorry, fun the penicillin was discovered from a uh, fungus. I'm sorry, uh, it was a mold. I said it right the first time. And we can use them to mass produce insulin and vaccines and plenty of other useful products. Bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotic organisms and you will hear me rant to no end if prodded about how archaea is kind of this grab bag, uh, catch-all group. If you don't know what to do with it, stick it there. And Pertiste is also kind of the same way, but you know we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, bacteria and archaea have distinct molecular and cellular differences. Again, mostly because if you can't call it a bacteria, you throw it in the archaea group. Prokaryotes do not have uh, nuclei or membrane-bound cytoplasmic organelles that you find in eukaryotic organisms. And archaea and bacteria are not particularly closely related, and eukarya are more closely related to archaea than to bacteria. Um, so archaea, you have uh, the genome is a single closed circular DNA molecule. They reproduce asexually via binary fission. Uh, plasma, the membrane. Uh, is different from bacteria and eukaryotes because as a single lipid bilayer with branch side chains they tend to be very acid and heat tolerant the walls lack peptidoglycan which distinguishes them from bacteria because even gram negative bacteria have some peptidoglycan in archaea the cell wall is largely a polysaccharide in others it's mostly protein or in some archaea. So again, you know, archaea, big grab bag thing. We don't know what to do with it. Stick it over there. Many inhabit very extreme environments, uh, thermoacidophiles, high temperature, high, uh, low pH, highly acidic. Methanogens live in anaerobic environments and they use methane to, you know, uh, halophiles love salty things, which if you've ever played, you know, any of the Halo franchise, it is quite fitting that a halo file is something that likes salt. Um, halo files have been isolated from environments such as the Dead Sea or the Great Salt Lakes or hypersaline uh, soils. They have additional pumps in their plasma membrane that can, that have a light power protein that basically just keeps pumping chlorine or I'm sorry, chloride out of them to prevent them from dehydrating. And uh, they often have photosynthetic pigments um, or carry out photosynthesis, photosynthesis using the pigment bacterial rhodopsin instead of chlorophyll. Uh, thermoacidophiles, like it says on the 10, like really hot, acidic, aqueous environments, so hot springs, geysers, underwater volcanoes, that sort of thing. They're able to survive temperatures as high as 80 degrees Celsius, which is you know not too far from boiling, which is quite impressive. Methanogens are chemoautotrophic organisms, meaning that they produce their own food from chemical sources. Uh, in this case, they use uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen as energy sources, which, you know, methane, and then the methane is uh, produced as a byproduct. They live in anaerobic environments such as swamps, lakes, uh, rice paddies, intestines of animals. Um, the, this is why uh, our methane is very potent greenhouse gas, but it's short acting. But this is why um, scientists have suggested changing the diet or developing vaccines to inhibit the growth of these archaea in cows because they literally produce tens of thousands of tons of methane a year uh, via their digestive tracts. So when you hear people with extreme positions on environment uh, or environmental regulation talking about getting rid of all the cows. This is why, because they have all these methanogen bacteria in their digestive systems. But that aside, bacteria are the most common type of prokaryotic on earth. There's, uh, yeah, we've identified over 9,000 species, but it is estimated that there's about 10 
million or so, or, or rather tens of millions that we have not named. And a lot of that is because they are particularly difficult to get to grow on culture uh, in a, in a, in a petri dish in a lab. They have very specific requirements for where they will grow. And it's very hard to figure that out just from random cultures. One of the ways we know that there are so many that we haven't named is if you can um, actually just collect DNA from like soil or you know, wherever and sequence it. And there are so many sequences that we've never that have, we've never identified the origin from. Odds are it's from you know all these millions of species of bacteria. Some of them are like really like that we have figured out how to culture are like really weird in their requirements. Like there's one off that, uh, the weirdest one I can think of off the top of my head it requires, uh, rabbit testicles to be a component in the auger in order for it to grow. Who figured that out and how? I don't know. But I assume that would be a fairly interesting conversation. Tangent aside, you can find bacteria like literally anywhere. You know, pick a place, there's bacteria there. For instance, you have plenty of staph on your skin. Staph epidermidis lives primarily on the epidermal layer of us. If you've ever been in a hospital, then you have a very high likelihood of having MRSA which is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus living in your nasal passages. So don't pluck your, no your nose hairs. Trimming them's fine, but if you pluck them, then you expose the, uh, your circulatory system potentially to uh, staph, and if you've been in a hospital, then potentially to MRSA. And there's this nice little anastomosis called uh, Castleback's area that uh, anastomosis with the blood vessels inside your skull. So plucking your nose hairs can provide a pathway for an infection to get inside your brain. So don't do that. But again, tangent aside. So bacteria comes, there's three basic shapes. You've got the rods, spherical, and then spiral shaped. So your you know, bacillus, cocci, and uh, spirillium or spirochete. You can find them individual or in uh, groups or arrangements. All bacteria have a plasma membrane. Most contain cell wall, or uh, most have a cell wall containing peptidoglycan. If you've got a lot of peptidoglycan, then you're gram positive. If you have a little bit, you're gram negative. Uh, they use flagella to move around uh, and fembrate to bind to surfaces. They have a circular. Uh, Single circular chromosome, which is located in nucleoid region. Again, they're not eukarya, so they don't have a true nucleus, but they have a nucleoid. A lot of them have plasmids, which are extrachromosomal DNA, which can carry genes for all manner of things, including antibiotic resistance. And uh, we commonly use them to you know, carry DNA into bacteria for genetic engineering purposes. Um, I've had a lab where or I've had a class which is basically a standalone lab and by the end of it is um, you are expected to have cloned a plasmid into a colony of DNA, of uh, a bacteria of, uh, I think we just used E. coli and it glows at the end if you did it right so you know that's kinda cool it's, it's actually a fairly simple thing to do uh, they also contain ribosomes and have various types of storage granules. Uh, bacteria again reproduce via binary uh, fission. You know, the cell replicates and the, its genome and everything just cuts itself in half, and you got two of them. They can form an endospore, which is highly resistant to um, harsh conditions, uh, heat, disinfectants, antibiotics. Uh, some of the more famous organisms that produce an endospore are Bacillus anthracis, uh, which is the causative agent of anthrax, Clostridium botulinum, which, you know, botulism, and Clostridium tetani, tetanus. Clostridium botulinum is quite ubiquitous in the soil, though, I mean, it's fairly rare compared to all the other things living in the soil, but just a few nanograms of botulism toxin is enough to be lethal. Um, 
and the toxin itself is quite resistant to cooking. So if you ever see like any of your canned goods have swollen or you know the can is, is swollen, throw it out because it's probably botulism that's done that to it. And you can cook it and kill the organism, but uh, there's still going to have spores in it and still going to be toxin in that food, so don't risk it. This is also uh, Clostridium botulinum spores is also why you don't give honey to children under two years of age because their immune system is not yet sufficiently developed to kill the spores and so botulism will set up or, or is capable of gestating in their digestive system and can be lethal. Okay, so back to reproduction, gene transfer. So they do not uh, engage in sexual reproduction, but they can shuffle their DNA, their DNA. So you can do conjugation in which a donor cell passes the DNA to the recipient cell by means of a sex pelis. And so you've got uh, P positive and P negative cells. And so usually what happens is like they, they pass plasmids back and forth. And uh, the P positive is the one that has the pillus. And in addition to passing whatever information along with the plasmid, it also passes the information for making a pillus. So a P positive links up with the P negative, sends the information over, and then the new one is also P positive at that point, so it can spread very rapidly. Transformation, the uh, bacteria takes that DNA from the environment released by dead bacteria. So, you know, basically everyone's getting wiped out, cannibalize their genes and see if you can find something useful. And then transduction, uh, viruses carry DNA from cell to cell because most of the viruses that, uh, or most, most bacteria are wiped out, or that are killed, are wiped out by bacteriophages. It's something like 40% of the biomass of the bacterial population is killed every day by bacteriophages. And um, because they insert themselves into their DNA, and then you know pop back out again. Sometimes they carry bits of bacterial DNA from bacteria to bacteria. Process wide range of metabol of metabolisms. Most are heterotrophic, which means they have to eat to live. The meaning so in this case require outside source of organic compounds. Some are anaerobic and cannot use oxygen as the final electron acceptor. Instead, they use sulfur or nitrate. At one point in time. Uh, basically everything that lived on this planet was anaerobic and as photosynthetic organisms started to take root there was this mass extinction I'm not sure if it if it counts as one of the the great dyings but because uh, there's been like five or six of those events and depending on who you ask we're going through another one now um, and again depending on who you ask they'll say that it is the uh, the human extinction, I think, is what they're calling it, because uh, we're the thing that is, depending on who you ask again, we are the thing that is, that is causing this uh, latest mass extinction. But again, there's been multiple ones throughout history. There's nothing new, and life has recovered every time. 99.9% .9 of every species that has ever existed is extinct. And so one of the Big reasons for that is initially most everything was uh, anaerobic and then photosynthetic organisms took root and start pumping out all this oxygen and it was absolutely devastating to the majority of living things because if you can't use oxygen as your final electron acceptor it is toxic to you and it will kill you. Uh, but if you can then you know you can produce much more sophisticated and complicated organisms that are have radically higher energy outputs. Think about the difference between fermentation and uh, uh, cellular respiration, you know, 2 versus 36 ATP, you know. But uh, anyway, so chemoautotrophs reduce carbon dioxide uh, to an organic compound. I mean, a chemoautotroph meaning they're using a chemical to be able to, you know, feed themselves instead of being heterotrophic and having to feed on things. These electrons from ammonia, hydrogen gas, hydrogen sulfide, or minerals such as iron, sulfur, you know, just whatever. 
Cyanobacteria have chlorophyll and other pigments. Um, they're you know photosynthetic and use solar energy to produce their own food. These are the guys that like kill all the anaerobic things. You know, most of them anyway. They can form toxic algal blooms, and some have a symbiotic relationship with fungi, and that produces a, a lichen. Not, you know, werewolf, but the thing that looks like moss growing on the side of the plant. Some photosynthetic bacteria split hydrogen sulfide instead of water to produce sulfur as a byproduct, and some are capable of nitrogen and carbon fixation. Most bacteria do not cause disease, thankfully, but those that do have virulence factors, which is a characteristic that allows them to cause disease, and they can share those genes with other bacteria. In the case of E. coli 0157H7, this is uh, traveler's diarrhea, uh, and it's caused by a plasmid that allows them to produce uh, this particular toxin, which damages the lining of your intestine. Uh, Streptococcus is uh, more common, is the most common uh, bacterial infection. Streptococcus pneumonia causes uh, pneumonia, meningitis, ear infections. Uh, mutans co contributes to dental caries or, you know, uh, cavities. And then strep pyogenes. Um, Pyogenes could honestly disappear off the face of the earth and I'd be much happier. It causes strep throat, if you're lucky, uh, in pedigo and infants, which is a real mild skin disease. But it can also produce scarlet fever, uh, rheumatic fever, and necrotizing fasciitis, which is a form of flesh-eating uh, disease. You can also get uh, toxic shock syndrome from uh, toxins produced by... Oh, I'm sorry, that's... that's uh, Staphylococcus, Staph Staph aureus, uh can produce toxic shock syndrome. And there's two forms of uh, toxic shock. There's the one that, that's caused by, you know, a traditional infection getting out of, out of hand and it just starts pumping toxin into your system. And then there is, um, I forget precisely what it's called off the top of my head, but it's something like... Um, tampon associated toxic shock syndrome and it is what it sounds like you know the the sanitary product has staph aureus on it and it's producing toxin and so when you use it it comes in contact with their epithelial um, membrane then can diffuse toxin directly into your bloodstream so yeah if you if you think your sanitary products might have been contaminated don't use them because bad things can happen. Uh, and again, so the, the big thing with MRSA is it's resistant to methicillin, which is our frontline antibiotic in a lot of cases. Uh, and the scary bit is you have to use vancomycin to kill MRSA, but there are strains now that are becoming uh, vancomycin resistant as well. So if you are given antibiotics for something, which, first of all, don't ask for antibiotics for a cold, because that's a virus. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, but if you are given antibiotics, take them as prescribed and take the full dose. Because if you take like half of it and then you're like, oh, I'm feeling better, I don't need to take the rest, you've killed off the ones that were most susceptible to it. Meaning that the ones that are left, either through sheer luck or mutation, have a resistance to it, and you need to give your immune system all the help that it can get to wipe them out so you are not shedding antibiotic-resistant bacteria into the environment. Tuberculosis is a chronic disease caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Very slow growing. I mean, this can take decades to kill you. Um, usually infects the lungs, but it can affect elsewhere and active lesions in the lung cause tubercles uh, from the immune response, essentially a calcification of your lungs, and eventually you suffocate when your lungs turn to uh, limestone, basically. Uh, pretty gnarly way to go. At one point in time, we completely eradicated tuberculosis from the United States. It used to be referred to as uh, consumption. That's what killed Doc Holliday, among many others. Uh, along with roughly 2 million people per year, 
but we have been seeing a resurgence in tuberculosis in the United States, particularly among uh, specific populations. Tuberculosis uh, symptoms, so you've got inflammation in lungs, forming of tubercles, can persist for years, cause coughing, which can spread the bacteria within the lungs or to other parts of the body, uh, damaged tissue, hardens and calcifies, which is then visible on x-rays. If you do anything working in a hospital, they're going to give you a, a TB skin test because you don't want this anywhere near sick people because they're already, you know, immunocompromised because they're fighting off another infection. So while their you know, system's weak, you can they can easily catch tuberculosis. So you get a TB skin test, which looks for, you know, uh, antibodies. And, uh, but the confirmatory test is an x-ray. Uh, food poisoning, so you got two main types of food poisoning. Some are caused by a toxin growing in the food, uh, and some are caused by an inflammation of the intestines. So if we're talking things something with a toxin, uh, Clostridium botulinum produces one of, if not the most toxic substance on earth. A few grams could wipe out a large city. So again, if you see, if, if, if you even suspect that that can has you know swollen or puffed out. Chuck that in the cry in the trash. Do not eat it. Um, and then some cause some of them the, the it's it's caused by uh, infection uh, that inflames the intestines. So salmonella is a good case of, or a good example of that. Uh, what's really nasty is cholera because it burrows into the intestinal lining and inflames it to the point where basically the, all the water in your body floods into your intestines and, uh, you know, exits the back end and you die of dehydration. So, yeah. Antibiotics inhibit a bacteria by interfering with uh, a unique metabolic pathway. The unique meaning that it's unique to, you know, bacteria uh, and not our eukaryotic cells. So the expectation is that it will not harm us. And uh, they work in a multitude of ways. Some of the two of which are listed here for us are inhibiting uh, protein synthesis. So erythromycin and tetracycline or cell wall biosynthesis, penicillin, cephalosporins. There's other ways to do it. You can, you know, prevent them from replicating their DNA or whatever. Uh, not all antibiotics actually kill the bacteria. A lot of them are bacteria static, meaning that it stops them from reproducing, but your immune system still has to actually destroy the infection. Again, another reason why you finish the whole course instead of, oh, I feel better, I can stop taking them. Problems associated with this, so it is entirely possible to have a fatal allergic reaction to a bacteria. A lot of people are uh, allergic to penicillin, for instance. Uh, you can kill off your normal flora, many of which are beneficial to you, and that can lead to things like irritable bowel syndrome, or um, in small children, you know, under two years of age, if you give them antibiotics, there is a a link between that and higher probability of adult uh, obesity because it alters the gut flora, which alters your absorption of particular nutrients and things. Uh, bacteria can become resistant to the antibiotics uh, because you know they have pretty terrible proofreading mechanisms, so the odds of their DNA getting jumbled somewhere along the way is fairly high. And, and once you've got one, then they can exchange that genetic material, including the uh, resistance genes. Viruses are acellular structures that require a living cell to reproduce, meaning that they're an obligate parasite. Because they use the host cellular machinery, such as ribosomes and enzymes and things, to make copies of themselves, they're not technically considered alive because, they're, again, they're not composed of cells. They're basically just like rogue cellular machinery. Viroids are simpler forms of viruses. So like you see over here with the, the virus, it's got this nice protein capsid coat around it. And then you got, you know, the stuff inside. A viroid is basically just the stuff inside. And prions are uh, basically just infectious proteins. So it's a protein that uh, because of its particular shape or configuration, 
can distort or alter the shape of other proteins and uh, that leads to some gnarly infections. Um, again, viruses are not assigned to any of the kingdoms because they're smaller than bacteria, not composed of cells, technically not considered living. Two main components, you've got the capsid, which is the outer uh, portion composed of proteins. Sometimes they have a lipid envelope because a lot of times like when they uh, leave the infected cell, they'll take parts of its li uh, lipid membrane with it, which helps them invade a new cell and avoid the immune system. Um, they can either have DNA or RNA in their, uh, as their nuclear core material, but, uh, I'm sorry, nucleic acid core, but, uh, you can't have both. So basically, you know, the virus attaches to the host cell, hijacks its ribosomes and cellular machinery and reproduces itself until, uh, it kills the cell. But you can also go into like a, a, a latent stage, and so you do the, uh, the lytic phase, and they'll lay dormant in a host cell, either A, just kind of chilling somewhere, like in, you know, or B, they insert themselves into your DNA, and they're ju they'll just hang out there, and when the cell reproduces, they copy the viral DNA along with it, just like it was any other DNA, but then when they're stressed, then they leave the Lysogen or they enter the uh, they leave the lytic phase and enter the lysogenic phase and start making copies of themselves until the cell lyses and dies, which is why like if you've got uh, the herpes simplex one, which gives you cold sores, it's not the STD, that's herpes simplex two. Uh, you just get cold sores from this. They show up during times of stress because they've left their dormancy. Retroviruses, it has a RNA genome and produces an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which uh, converts RNA to DNA, and uh, it's called cDNA or copy DNA. And then that incorporates itself into the host genome and becomes a provirus. We have multiple proviruses in our DNA right now that have just been passed down from generation to generation for you know God knows how long. And they don't seem to really do anything or negatively affect us, so you know we just leave them be. The theory is is that they function as some form of at this point that they function as some form of like long term, um, like multi generational genetic uh, immuno memory to help us fight off similar viruses later. But again, that's highly speculative. So. You know, who knows? Uh, cold and influenza. Influenza is, you know, the flu. Uh, the colds are caused by rhinovirus. And, you know, there's tons of rhinoviruses and they're constantly mutating because, you know, terrible proofreading mechanisms. So, you know, you're never actually going to be, like, completely immune to the cold. It's just, you, you know, new one every season. Uh, flu is caused by influenza. It's a little, it's worse than the cold, you know, cold's like a week and you just kind of feel like crap, but the flu is, you know, a couple of weeks, um, can be fatal. Usually it's not that big a deal, but every so often you get like the 1918 Spanish flu that wipes out, you know, what was that one? 10% of the population or something like that, like of the planet. So you know, they can be pretty gnarly. The reason that you're, and again, crappy proofreading mechanisms, and they can like recombine and share, share bits of, you know, their protein capsid or their, you know, uh, DNA or RNA. And, you know, so, guessing which flu, which influenza virus is going to be most prevalent next season is, you know, taking a stab in the dark, and then you have to mass produce enough to give to people. So that's why some years the flu vaccine works really good and some years it's, you know, useless because it's just uh, educated guess. That's basically what we're talking about with this uh, antigenic drift and shift, uh, small changes and then new combinations. Measles, uh, highly contagious uh, virus in humans spread through respiratory route, seven to 12 day incubation period before flu-like symptoms and a rash appear. Uh, 10 to 15 percent fatality rate in less developed countries. In the U.S., it's usually not that big a deal to get some measles because you know we have a 
pretty advanced uh, healthcare system, but there's still a chance that it is fatal even with medical intervention. The MMR vaccine protects against measles, mumps, and rubella, but again, it's not recommended for pregnant women because uh, these are, if I'm remembering correctly, these are attenuated virus um, vaccines, so the fetus can have negative reactions to the vaccine, uh, which is why you give them to children, so that way they have lifelong immunity. Uh, incidentally, this MMR vaccine was the one that Dr. Wakefield wrote his uh, paper on trying to claim a link between the vaccine and leaky gut syndrome and then leaky gut syndrome to autism, but he had an absurdly small sample size which he cherry-picked to skew the data and then just straight up falsified results at the end. And it wasn't even that he was trying, he was simply trying to get this MMR vaccine off the market so he could sell his own measles vaccine. And that's where the whole anti-vax thing sprang from, even though that has been repeatedly discredited again and again and again. And I highly encourage you to look up that paper and read it yourself. I have, and if you know anything at all about reading scientific literature, you will see how garbage of a paper that is. And understand that this individual's greed has led to a high, pro high number of deaths and lifetime disabilities as a result of the misinformation that he spread. Uh, anyway, rant aside, Herpes virus, so most of the time herpes is latent. You've got four types of herpes viruses that cause disease in humans. So simplex one, cold sores and blisters. Yeah, you know, it's not that really that big a deal. It's, it's more of an annoyance than anything. Herpes simplex two, that's your STD. So that's uh, genital herpes. Uh, varicella, varicella voster, it's chicken pox and shingles. And again, those are vaccine, there's vaccines for that. And then Epstein-Barr virus, which gives causes a infectious mononucleosis, the you know kissing disease, which is basically like two to six month you know flu, but with more fatigue, kind of a pain. Uh, antiviral drugs. So here's the thing, because viruses use host machinery. It's really hard to find something that will affect that without harming the host cells. Antibiotics are completely ineffective. They do they do literally nothing, except maybe kill off your own you know natural flora, which might actually help the virus. Um, there are some antivirals that can interfere with viral replication, some that prevent viral attachment, uh, but often there's nothing available for a given virus. So, yeah. A cool fact though, uh, Tamiflu uses uh, star anise. Uh, or an extract from star anise, which you also use to make licorice. No, that's not, uh, that does not mean that you can eat licorice to make your flu better, but that's uh, where it comes from, which is kind of cool. Uh, plant viruses and viroids. Basically, plant viruses enter through uh, wounds in the plant or insects, and uh, plant cells are generally pretty resistant to infection because they have those you know cell walls, which we do not have. But if they're damaged, then you know things can work their way through it. Viroids are short little naked pieces of RNA that do not code for proteins, uh, just you know makes more of itself basically. And then a prion is uh, an infectious protein and uh, short for proteinaceous infectious particle prion. Uh, sponge, they cause uh, spongiform encephalopathies which are inherited and transmissible by ingestion, transplant, and surgical instruments. In sheep, it's called scrapies. In cattle, it's called mad cow disease. And in humans, it's called uh, Creutzfeldt Jacobs disease. It's like something collapse disorder in deer, which I can go on a, a rant about that in a minute. This was first identified, though, in uh, the Amazon, as I'm remembering correctly, among a native tribe, uh, because all of the elders trembled, and like their arms and hands shook violently all the time. 
and they called that kuru. The thing is, they had this belief that when one of your relatives or a member of the tribe died, that everyone would eat them. And because it was better for them to be warm in your belly and still with you forever that way than, you know, cold and buried in the ground. As a result, they were infected with kuru, you know, Kreutzfeldt, Jacob, mad cow, you know, what you want to call it. They had this prion disease, that, and you can see kind of in this picture, the white spots here are where the, it's called spongiform encephalopathies because basically it turns your brain into, you know, a sponge or Swiss cheese, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's terrible. The one, the thing for about the deer is, uh, it can actually spread from deer to deer, like th from, uh, if, it, if a deer dies, the plants around where it died can have the protein on them or absorb it, and it can be stable there for a few days or so. And then another deer comes along and eats, you know, the grass near where the other one bled on it and gets infected. So there's a fairly large percentage of the deer population that's infected with this particular thing, with this colony collapse uh, cryon. But, uh, that one doesn't appear to be transmissible to humans, so I suppose your venison's still safe, but I wouldn't risk it. Basically, a uh, prion has this abnormal shape, and it interacts with the co uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions on other proteins and causes it to uh, twist and contort its shape so it no longer functions like it's supposed to. It's just a chain reaction of that and causes uh, cells to die and you know, degenerative uh, damage to nervous tissue. Uh, that's it for chapter 28. Uh, if you have questions, comments, concerns, let me know as soon as possible, and I'll see you next time.